Welcome to Action Potential. I'm Sahan Ranamukharachi. Our goal is to propagate ideas that can revolutionize medical care delivery. Join us as we amplify the voices of thought leaders, explore remote physiological monitoring, and ignite a wave of change. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to episode five of the Action Potential podcast. Today, I'm joined by David Rush who is a huge patient advocate for people living with kidney disease. And I'm so excited to bring David on uh, to our podcast to talk about a lot of things associated with uh, what people living with kidney disease go through. Um, David, thank you for being here. Um, Please tell our audience a little bit about yourself uh, and let's dig in. Thanks for having me. Uh, My name is David Rush, patient advocate, uh, recording artist, motivational speaker, I've uh, been on dialysis, was diagnosed in 2006, started dialysis in 2007, uh, was transplanted in 2010, which lasted me for seven years um, for my brother, for my uh, brother who's nine years older than me, saved my life for seven great years and uh, transitioned back to home dialysis um, after that. Um, you know, so one transplant in, I've done in-center dialysis, home dialysis, Post, post-transplant, post had my transplanted kidney removed and my native kidneys removed and had renal cancer in 2019. So I think I'm equipped to uh, speak on the subject of, of kidney health uh, going through all the ringer. And I, I'm excited to be uh, help to be a voice for our community. The entire spectrum. Really. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. Um, you call yourself a, a hope dealer, David. Uh Let's dig into that. I, I love sure. that. I love that phrase. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you consider yourself uh, the hope dealer. Well, you know, with becoming a, a dialysis patient, you know, patients will tell you, you can, it's a traumatic experience. You kind of feel like your life has been changed either for the, you know, mostly for the worse, you know, we believe it's for the worse. Um, the target audience, as far as dialysis goes, you know, 35% of African-Americans are, you know, usually diagnosed 13% of that don't even know they have it. And a lot of us crash into dialysis, but I look at it as a whole, you know, no matter race, creed, religion, whatever it is, we're all human and it's liable to take any of us out. We just happen to have the highest number. And I think it's due to, you know, diet, the way we eat and stuff like that. Um, When I got sick, you know, I kind of hit that depression stage too and didn't know where my life was going. Luckily having a great support system and having a great family and, and having a strong mindset, it allowed me to get through those first crucial six to nine months of dialysis and, um, you know, seeing people die around me in the centers and stuff like that um, didn't help either, but it kind of made me feel like, man, I just needed, at that time, I needed hope. I needed somebody to tell me things were going to be okay and that I was going to be able to get through this. And uh, I relied on my support system, like I said, on myself. And when I realized that I was better, I guess you could say, with dealing with dialysis and learning and educating myself, I definitely wanted to pass that on to others. So hope is something that we look for in doctors. We look for in dietitians, social workers, nurses, everyone involved. We look for that hope. And, and we, I believe that as patients and patient advocates, we need to learn to look for it in ourselves as well. So, you know, I feel like if I can be the one to give that out, you know, I, I have no problem being a hope dealer at all. That's wonderful to hear, um, David. It's it's very easy to become pessimistic when you see so many things not working out uh, in and right. around you. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, so what's been kind of uh, your grounding uh, source of truth, if you will, to make sure that you know when things don't go well, uh, which in in your life, as you said, someone who's lived through the entire spectrum of kidney disease, right. uh, there must have been so many downs as as much as, uh, you know, uh, ups. So how, what's been kind of your uh, source of truth for for that that hope? Is it is it in, now? Is it mostly internal? Uh, is it just about your mentality? As you said, you have a tremendous support group. Um, is it that the family like what what really drives you at the end of it when you're having the hardest day? Well, you know, uh, my mother, uh, we celebrated her 11th year of passing, uh, November 18th of this month. She was a very religious woman and uh, she brought me up in a church and, you know, introduced me to God and, you know, Christianity and all that kind of stuff. And um, I, I leaned on that for a long time, you know, and I still do. Um, I have walked away from it in my most depressed moments. I kind of, you know, didn't why me God type, you know, <laughs> thing that I had in the beginning. 
And then um, I kind of realized later, like, why not me? You know, I got a big mouth. I'm I'm a walking billboard, man. Maybe it's my purpose to be here and to help people get through these things. So I would say God first, my support system, you know, my wife, my children, uh, my family. We have a very big, tight knit family. And uh, my mom's had this mentality of this wins only mentality that I speak on. You know, my company is wins only lifestyle that came from her. Uh, she passed in 2012, like I said, and before she passed away, she sent a message out to everybody and said, thank you for your love and your prayers. But I know in the end I'm going to win. And her being on a deathbed literally days before she passed and considering herself a winner at that moment, because winning for her was meeting her maker. I think for me, uh, showed me that, man, this woman is on her deathbed and she called herself a winner. So there's no reason why I should ever, ever, ever lose again in my life. And so that mentality kind of drove me um, from to this day, literally. Um, that's the mentality that I live by. And that's the mentality and lifestyle that I push on everybody I come in contact with. Right. Well, uh, that's that's really, really inspiring to hear, David. Um, let's go back a little bit in your in your early days of being being diagnosed, I suppose, uh, with mm. chronic kidney disease. One thing that we we quite hear quite a lot is that realization that dialysis might be inevitable is one that people find quite hard to deal with. And in your case, mm. you've dealt with that multiple times right. uh, and, and under different circumstances. Can you walk us through like the, you know, how you found yourself to be different, maybe a uh, second time around compared to the first time and what what that journey was like to you? Well, you know, it definitely has to do with education. Um, not knowing anything going into it um, was the scariest part. You know, you have all these questions. You're seeing people who may have their underlying issues go through what they need to go through and, and the way that they are getting treatments and not responding well to them and things of that nature. You, you're not sure what's going to happen to you. You know what I mean? So you're going through that and you're really confused. It's a very, very traumatic experience in the beginning. Um, I often tell people, you know, the mental, mental, the mental health aspect of dialysis is so often missed with any chronic illness. It's not addressed as I feel like it should be addressed. You know, you develop a form of PTSD going into the centers. You're walking in the centers on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, seeing somebody doing treatment. You show up again that following Monday from having that weekend off and that person in the chair is gone. And you can't really understand why no one's going to tell you that they passed away. You just kind of get the look and they haven't been there for a week. And, you're like, man, I'm doing the same exact treatment as this person next to me and they're gone. So it just puts this pressure on you not to want to go to dialysis and not to want to be there. When is your day going to come? So it was very difficult opposed to now where, you know, I'm back on home dialysis now, um, you know, doing every other day on the tablet machine at home. Uh, I have more education and more confidence in myself and, you know, independence doing home dialysis. And just to add, like I said, the education part was key for me understanding what my body was going through, understanding the way my diet needed to be, understanding how important treatment was for me, um, and just listening to my body and being proactive in my health and that relationship with my doctors and all that stuff became very, very important to me. You know, after a while, when I realized what I was doing to myself and what was happening to my body in the beginning when I didn't know, and honestly probably didn't even care because uh, I just kind of was giving up at that point in the beginning. Um, so once you get that knowledge and that fulfillment and still wanting to live on dialysis, live being the key word, you start to understand, like, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you need to be here mm -hmm. and realizing how much that you are winning day to day. And there's people who got away worse than me. And once I realized those few things, it just made a shift in the way that I looked at dialysis, looked at chronic illness as a whole, looked at CKD and just approached it with a whole different mentality. Yeah, beautiful. And like you said, winning, right? And for, for, for you, it's really about showing up the next day and, yep. you know, making sure that you're using that not to be the be in and be, be all end all, but rather mm -hmm. uh, as a mechanism to continue to do what you really love. And one thing, I, uh, there are many things I, I'd love to discuss with you, uh, David, but uh, for the for the maybe start off on a very positive note, despite being on dialysis, you still pursued your dream, didn't you? And yeah. would, you, would you mind telling our audience a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, when I started off, it was football. That was a dream. And that's when I kind of just discovered my my uh, illness was when I was getting a physical done for football and then, you know, moved on from that, went to college and was doing film production. And uh, I was doing film production because I love music and I wanted to learn both sides of the music business because the music videos were so big for 
artist that I was like, man, if I can learn, you know, how to do my videos, I won't get charged a lot of money for them because I can shoot them myself. And so that was my mentality going into the arts. I was always in, into the arts, acapella choir, all those things. You know, I did theater. I was a theater kid. And so, you know, I was always into arts and music. So I pursued my music career during college as well. Um, ended up coming out of there and, and really hitting it hard after college, you know, really going full force with the music. Ended up signing a record deal uh, with Pitbull um, and with Mr. 305 Inc. and Universal. Um, at the same time, he got me my deal there. And I was able to tour the world and, you know, do various tours with him, me, him, Flo Rider, Kevin Rudolph, LMFAO, Enrique Iglesias, uh, just just tours with these guys that, you know, I, I grew up listening to and grew up on and, you know, also writing music. Once I got sick and realized that, you know, dialysis was kind of hitting me pretty hard, um, you know, actually doing dialysis on the road. My first ever tour, I did dialysis, home hemodialysis on the road, uh, 42 city tour. Uh, with Pitbull in 2009. And then when I received my transplant in 2010, I toured again in Canada with him. But at this point, my son had just been born uh, three months earlier. And it was like the energy that I had to tour, energy that I had to pursue my music. It was like, man, I had this new life. Do I use it just to fulfill this rap career? And it was just like, or do I use it, you know, to be the best dad that I can? And uh, I chose the latter, man. After the tour, I just wanted to go home and just really just be a father. So I, I've lived maybe two or three different lives, um, you know, football, uh, recording artists. I still very much involved in the music and, you know, writing for TV, writing for other artists, mixing and mastering records for other artists and stuff like that. But um, now I moved on to the third leg of my lifestyle, which is now the motivational speaking and advocacy work, which is my real passion and purpose projects that I do a lot of. And um, so I've been able to live these various lives, still doing dialysis, still being a patient, transplanting, renal cancer, all those things. And just mentality is just to stay forward and, and, and stay moving. I feel like if I get stagnant, you know, that's when things start to go down. You know, I just have to keep that forward motion. Every day that I wake up, I have another chance to be great. And that's what I wake up to try and do every day. So much rich, richness in the experience uh, that you've lived through, even though most of it is quite traumatic for for yeah, for people to to really understand. But the, the fact that even through trauma, you can actually in, do the things that you love is, I think, yeah. one of the biggest things uh, to take away from uh, here, David. Now, you mentioned you were on tour while on home dialysis. So when you went into dialysis for the first time, you pretty quickly transitioned into home dialysis. And what was that experience like for you? Did you start inpatient or in center and then move into home dialysis? Is that what happened? Yeah, I actually woke up on dialysis my first one. You know, it wasn't something I walked into. I woke up with a catheter and was doing dialysis and, uh, mm. you know, in the hospital first. And, and then I would transition to a DCI unit doing in-center dialysis. And I'm sure that the modalities were given to me in the beginning, but when patients become, you know, first get into dialysis or any type of chronic illness, you don't really hear, see, or know anything in those first three to six months. You know, you're just there and you just traumatic experience has changed your whole life. You're not paying attention to the choices you have. You're not really hearing the doctor. You're not really hearing it. You're just trying to make it to that next day. Da um, David, so w when you say you woke up to dialysis, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a word called crashed in. A yeah. lot of patients you hear have crashed into treatments where, you know, they don't know they have it. And by the time they find out they're stage four and it's a very fast progression from there. Um, I have S FSGS, which is one of the slowest moving um, one in every million people get, um, you know, disease, kidney diseases. So I may have been sick for years before I ended up on dialysis, but just didn't know. Didn't I didn't know, know the symptoms. I didn't feel anything. There might have been some swelling and stuff like that, but I was always a big kid. So it didn't seem too off to me, you know, like that. So by the time that I realized that something was wrong, I was already stage three. And uh, the doctor gave me a year to live if I didn't start dialysis within that year. Of course, denial. Didn't want to hear that. Just kept living my life. You know, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And then you know, ended up um, getting to the point where I was just exhausted all the time and feeling sick. And by the time it got me into the room, it was like I needed dialysis immediately. So I kind of crashed into it. So was there some kind of a trigger event that actually made you wake up to being catheterized? Yeah. And uh, yep. Yeah, literally, I came home from work. I was working a full time job at Staples delivering while I was pursuing my music okay. career at the same time. And I would come home and just be exhausted. Um, my appetite would be horrible. I would taste like nickels. 
like, you know, metal metallic tasting all the time. And, and I didn't know what it was. I knew I had this kidney thing going on, but of course, just in denial of what was happening. Um, and then I was talking to my sister one day and just kept falling asleep on her while mid conversation. And she just was like, you don't look good. You know, we need to get you to the doctor. And I, of course I'm fighting it. Like, ah, I just need vitamins. I just need, you know, just in that full denial, man, full fledged denial. And basically, you know, my older sister was like, man, look, we're going to go to the hospital. You need to go. And I ended up just like sleeping the whole way there and then foggy remembering getting into the hospital and blood pressure was high. And, and next thing you know, you know, they're putting me to sleep to put a catheter in my chest and Got it. starting dialysis that night. Right. And so your first experience in home dialysis, just to go back to our initial topic, thank you for mm -hmm. kind of walking us through that journey of waking up to dialysis. Mm -hmm. Once you move to home dialysis for the first time, one thing that kind of rest, struck with me a lot is we, we think of home dialysis as really enabling patients, uh, people living with uh, dialysis as the key modality of survival, basically, mm -hmm. um, to, to take ownership of when they do dialysis at their mm -hmm. own schedule from the comfort of their home, all home. And it, it, the value proposition for a patient is typically very good. But when we spoke um, uh, recently, you mentioned, no, that turned my home into a clinic. Right. And, and, and what was that experience like then compared to how you're able to do home dialysis now? I think it, again, is experience, experience and education. You know, it sounds great to be able to do these things at home and stuff like that. But, you know, I call them three W. You got to have the will, the why and the want to do these things. You know, you have to want to do this treatment at home and really have the, the will to do it at home and, you know, understand the circumstances. And you also have to have a why. You got to have a reason why you want to be home, a reason why you want to have those extra hours given back, you know, to be able to control, you know, your your independence that you kind of lose when you start uh, dialysis. So, you know, you're told when you're going to do treatment. These are your days. These are your times. If you miss them, you miss them. You can't go back. Uh, God forbid you miss them, though, because then you get sick and then you have to treat in the hospital and now your day is gone. So it's like there's there's no you kind of gain back that independence a little bit when you come home. Is everybody a candidate? No. Is it all peaches and cream? No, it's not. You really need to be dedicated and honest with yourself when getting into home dialysis. That is something you're going to stick to and that you're going to be able to candidate yourself and be able to walk, you know, get yourself through this, get yourself through it. And you got to have great trainers and stuff like that. But the reason why for me it was different before after having children and getting my transplant and then losing it and going straight back to home dialysis, my circumstances changed. Mm. You know, I have two children in the house. They run the house. It's their mess everywhere. Then I'm bringing in all my boxes of equipment and, and, and stuff that I need for my treatment. And, you know, it's meshing the house, it's kind of overtaking the home. And so there's no room for my kids' things, my wife's things, my personal things. It's just dialysis in the home and the constant hearing the machine running and doing five, six days a week and constantly tired and daddy can't go today because daddy has to do dialysis. I just felt like I was burning myself out and I felt like I was taken away selfishly from my family's experience of just living a normal life, I guess you could say. And I didn't want my kids having to deal with that all the time and seeing daddy on that all the time, even though I wanted them to know what I went through. I just didn't feel like it was fair to always implement this in their life, let it run their life too. Like I felt it was running mine. So I opted out to go in center. How is it different now? You mentioned the Tableau machine, you know, yeah. from outset medical, really yep. beautifully crafted, uh, yeah, well-engineered machine that's sleek. Uh, how, how, how is life different now for you, uh, you know, David? My biggest thing uh, getting back on home dialysis in 2020 was I didn't want all those boxes in my house. I didn't want a whole bunch of material. I didn't want to turn my home into a, a facility again. And that was my biggest thing. I really denied going back on home treatment. My doctor was very adamant. COVID was starting to really flare up and he knew my lifestyle. I was like, look, man, I think you need to go home. I think it'd be best for you to get home. You know, you're still young, man. You know, like, let's, let's give this another shot. I turned him down a few times. He's like, man, look, just give me one chance to get a demo done on this machine and see how you like it. I went and got a demo done. I liked the machine. And my biggest question was how many boxes are coming home? <laughs> And, you know, do I have to hear is this big thing coming back at my home? Do I got to hear the batching all night? Like, I just didn't want to go through that again is, you know, and yeah. uh, he was like, no, it's very different. You know, instant batching. You're on in 15 minutes. The boxes will fit in one closet nice. unless you, of course, you get extra things. And nice. so I, I folded and, and, and bought it home. 
And, uh, you know, it's been it's been great for me, man. It's honestly been nothing against the next stage machine at all. Saved my life yeah. for a few years, man. It gave me opportunities to do things I've never done before, touring and all that type of stuff. So no, you know, no, no shade towards the next machine at all. Um, yeah. It saves a lot of people's it's, life and, yeah. and, and it's a good machine for people who are good on it. So was, this just works ask, better for me. Yeah, I was going to ask you, actually, what would have allowed you at the time to tour would have been the NX. Uh, next stage machine. The next right? stage yeah, machine is what allowed me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you I know, mean, it was new. I was probably yeah, yeah. one of the first first ten thousand patients on it. Okay. Um, and you know, I was able to. I think I traveled the most with it, uh, doing fifty days on the road with it. Yeah. I think, and you know, the support system of the Davidas and you know all the companies that helped me out picking up supplies in every other city and next stage working with me as well at that time. You know, they were a brand new company and did pretty much yeah. took a took a chance with me traveling with it that much too. It allowed me to get better numbers to get my transplant. So no shade towards the next one. It, it kept nice. me alive for a very long time. It was a lifeline for me. Um, just preference now, knowing what I know and doing what I do, just to tablo just works a little better for me now. But nice. hey, more power to the people on next stage, of course. No, no, no shade at all. Dave, Dave, you said your nephrologist, your kidney doctor really told you, give this a try, right? Can you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about your your interactions with your care team? Uh, I assume sure. it's not just, as you said, education is such a big part of it. There's such a big workforce in kidney care to support patients across the board, not just from a clinical uh, decision-making standpoint, but, you know, support to to treat, tell pe people how to do certain procedures properly, diet, uh, probably, you know, mental health is a big issue, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. What does your care team look like? Uh, you know, I had a, I had a, the privilege of having a couple the first one that i had for the first 15 years of okay, being well. a patient that was um my care team in new jersey uh dr jane dr kabaria um you know dr desai there are my doctors out there in jersey that were my day one doctors you know dr jane was brand new was young sporty fly dressed doctor and uh then you had your dr kabaria dr desai who were a little bit older uh statesman of the crew not too much older, but, you know, had been in there a little longer. And, you know, we just developed a great relationship, which I feel 15 is 15 years is a long time, right? It's a long time to yeah. be able to deal and text message. And they consider your side of the story. They hear you out. They're just not looking at flow sheets and prescribing yeah. things. They're talking to you as a person. And I think that's what made our relationship so great. This is one thing that we that I often hear from a lot of nephrologists that I speak to. One thing that they that really drives them to nephrology is the fact that they'll build long term relationships with the with the people that they care for, which is really nice to hear. Uh, yep. On top of the the nephrologists, the kidney doctors, uh, who else uh, do you have supporting you now? You know, you gotta be in a home, be an in center first. You really gotta give it to those techs. You know, I, I still have relationships with my technicians from Jersey. We still talk. We follow each other on Facebook, Instagram. We still, nice. you know, we still chop it up, even though I'm home. You know, they're the people. They're the they're the bridge. You know, you want to know something about a patient in center, you talk to those techs. They see us over 20 hours a week in center. I mean, they know us sometimes better than family. Sometimes they're our support system. That's why yeah. a lot of people don't want to leave in center dialysis because of the relationships they build. Right. Um, you know, so I give it to the techs and the nurses and, you know, the people that you become close with. And then also your community of patients and people that you become friends with who are going through the same thing as you. They also become a support system, almost family. There's people's families that I still keep in touch with to this day from DCI back in 09 that I'm still friends with them. Or if, even if the patient passed on, I'm friends with the daughter or friends with the, the son or the, the husband. Um, we still keep in contact. And of course, your family, you know what I mean? You're not the, you know, I may be the one putting in the needles, but my whole family does dialysis. Everybody's involved in it. I'm just the one that has to sit there and do it. You know, my kids are involved. My wife is involved. She's seen the most of it. She was a medical assistant and was the person that took my blood work that actually found my creatinine levels were too high. So it was like without her, you know, I would have never known, you know, she was my girlfriend at the time. So it was like almost in contract that I had to marry her. You know, she she basically saved my life. So it was kind of like save your life. Got to marry this one. You know what I mean? And so. Yeah. You know, that support system is so vital for me. You know, my brother who gave me his kidney, like my mom, who unfortunately has passed on, my father, who unfortunately has passed on. But these people were so vital in, in me still going, you know, fighting and wanting to be here, you know, having those whys that I talked about earlier. 
Um, it basically stems from all over. And uh, yeah. even the network of Facebook, Instagram, those people too, man, they reach There's out community, to There's community, right? There's so much community and, and, yeah. and that keeps me going. That's that's brilliant to hear. Uh, you you mentioned uh, around you know support systems. Uh, what kind of tools uh, do you use at home to support you uh, to really live with this with the hope of winning, right? Um, mm -hmm. So what do you use today, and what do you wish you had? Can we can you kind of uh, talk us through that a little bit? Well, as far as what I use today, um, just to kind of keep that mentality, man, it, it's really not much, man. It's really just. I, I really live. I woke up today, man. I'm charged up. Like I, I just really live every day like that. You know, when I wake up and, and my kids are there and my wife is there, like for me, that's honestly like just enough. You know, mm -hmm. everything else is just everything else is just extra, extra icing, man. To be able mm -hmm. to to do this for a living, to be able to go and speak to community, it's it's almost a form of therapy for me, mm -hmm. because you know, with these traumatic experiences that I go through, even now going for another transplant having my evaluation. Now I have to have a heart catheter done next week. I have to go see a liver doctor. All those things start to weigh on you again. Like, oh God, what's wrong with me now? It's like going to the mechanic for breaks and they tell you you need a transmission. And you're like, wait, I just came in for breaks. You know what I mean? It's just like, it can be traumatic, but then it's like, okay, what am I doing it for? You know, I'm, I'm doing it to have a better life. I'm doing it to say more yeses to my children. I'm doing it to take the vacation with my wife that she deserves. You know, like I, I look at those things and I write them down, you know, I write them down and I read them and I put them out in podcasts. I put them out in speaking and it allows me to like a form of therapy to get these things out uh, for myself. You know, for I, I tell people a lot of things that I share is me thinking out loud, mm -hmm. you know, and just letting you hear it. And if it relates to you, great. If it doesn't, great. Yeah. If this is just how I'm thinking at the moment. If it helped you, amazing. You know what I mean? But right. it, it, it's really a therapy for me. So that's really all the tools I use. Social media, of course, to get things out and to hear that response from people and get that validation that you're in the right space and doing the right thing also allows you to say, okay, I'm doing the right thing. I'm walking in my purpose. Let's just keep going. And, and, and those things really, truly do help. And connecting with companies and all that stuff is so much cooler. I, I never thought I'd be in a room with these geniuses and, you know, and, and sit there and, and have million dollar conversations with these people. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So. Maybe let, let's double click a little bit on that, uh, David. How, how do we think about better equipping people like you who are really, uh, who are living through the, the, the disease uh, on, on, you know, through the entire spectrum twice over now mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in your case? Uh, how do technology developers, whether it's therapeutics, whether it's devices, whether it's more community-based tools, how should we think about um, uh, about engaging you better? How, how should we think about like, what are big gaps that exist for you uh, that might be fulfilled in other areas such as in diabetes, but not necessarily available uh, in the kidney, kidney disease realm? Well, you know, let's keep it on. Kidney disease isn't a sexy disease like cancer. And, you know, we don't get the, we don't get the ribbons and the, the football players wearing our colors. We don't get the big parades and, we don't get those things. It's just yeah. the fact that it's just the fact that it matter. And it's really because people associate for what I've seen, people associate kidney disease with like the wrong things. You know, like if you got cancer, oh man, you got cancer. Nothing against cancer. I'm not like dissing cancer. I'm just saying like it's a bigger scale on cancer. People know more about it. Yeah. There's so many different diseases of cancer and it's kind of spotlighted right as this main disease. And then when you think of kidney disease, people kind of put it in this bracket of oh, you must have done something to get it. Like, you know, either you, they think you drank too much or, you know, you abuse the substance or they, they don't understand that it's something that happens as natural as cancer. Like, you know, yeah. I, one out of every hundred people, a million people got a disease that I got. And it's just like, I think what has to happen there for developers and everything is just to keep the patient involved, yeah. just to keep us there. Um, and I see that happening a lot now with a lot of companies. Yeah, it, it is it is changing now, um, David, uh, to your point. I think, yeah, for example, something that's very relevant to kidney disease is, you know, cardiovascular and diabetes. Right? Yep. They're getting a ton of attention. They a have over attention. the past past 20 years. Um, 
And, you know, but the reality to your point is, you know, almost half of all people living with diabetes go on to get chronic kidney disease. And, and that's what the, we're realizing. It, they exactly. don't realize that it's all first cousins. They don't get that, you know what I mean? Like the heart yeah. and the diet, these are all connected, you know, and, to, to the kidneys, of course. And, and to, your, to, your, to, your, to your point, almost all p- people living with late stage chronic kidney disease also have heart failure. So it's not, so, you know, this is not, uh, this is not new, you know what I mean? Not, these are not disease conditions in isolation, right? They actually work hand in hand. And of course, exactly. They do. exactly. Um, and so, so, you know, when we, when I, like, from my perspective, we speak to a lot of people who live with insulin dependent diabetes, mm-hmm. uh, and those people have had the tools to really get their medications, right. Their diet, right. Uh, real, like real people like empowerment to see exactly. what's happening to their bodies and act on it. And most importantly, they have safety tools to like intercept certain types of uh, events early. So you don't have to ever collapse and end up, you know, catheterized in dialysis, for example. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it, it really opens the eyes to if we can do that in that population, but they mm-hmm. transition over to kidney disease, we really should be doing things here as well. Is that, is that how you look at things? I look at it like that too, because you figure we, we catch patients coming in, creatinine levels kind of tell the story. I feel like as soon as we see a bump in creatinine levels that are that much above the standard is when we need to start some form of treatment, either prevention treatment, something to slow the process or something to stop the process to treat, treat it immediately instead of monitoring. I, sometimes the monitoring where it gets on my nerves because monitoring to me is just watching it progress and then telling me a year down the line, okay, now we're almost dying. So let's start to work. And like, for me, it's like, that's not the way to monitor. If we're going to monitor, it's like, okay, you wouldn't sit there and watch a fire get to the point where it's about to burn the house down. You're trying to sustain it in that corner. So it doesn't spread. And it seems like with kidney disease, it's like we monitor it right till the building is about to burn. And then we start to spray water and try to come and it's not right. You know what I mean? I feel like the minute that we're at that point where that fire's lit, we start to contain it. We try to slow it down. We try to prevent it from spreading through the home. It should be the same thing with the the mindset for a diabetic comes in. Let's start to monitor the kidneys now because we know that the two are connected. High blood pressure. Let's monitor that so we can monitor the kidneys now. It should be a slate of all combined. It It shouldn't be. Let's just look at the heart. Let's just look at the heart. Let's just look at the diabetes. No, we know what these things affect. Let's look at everything. Let's scale everything every month. And mm-hmm. I think that's, I mean, it's, it sounds so simple, right? It's like, like, I'm not, you know, I don't have, I'm not a PhD, but I would think that sounds so simple to me. It's just like, hey, a normal blood work can tell you how your kidneys look. A normal blood work can tell you how your heart looks, you know, EKG. You know, your sugar can tell you what your diabetics, if you're diabetic or not. It's like, man, let's just do these things to follow it constantly through from the jump. Let's not wait till the house is burning down. And yeah. I think that is what's needed to happen. It brings brings me to a, a different point, which is I'm reading uh, Dr. Peter T.S. book on Outlive, which is what he's where he talks about this, you know, eggs falling from a top of a building. And we're just trying mm-hmm. to catch them as right. opposed to figuring out how to prevent them from falling. Right. And yeah. it's it was, it was very much uh, in line with something that I've been uh, uh, reading, reading these days. David, uh, we've appreciated having you on this uh, podcast and having your view on a lot of things that people living with kidney disease go through. Uh, are there any um, uh, anything that gives you even more hope than what you're dealing with, uh, mm-hmm. what you're dealing right now, um, that our listeners should uh, should be aware of? Like, what gives you so much optimism for the future of kidney disease? Um, and then, mm-hmm. and then, any last parting thoughts after that? I think what gives me hope for the future of kidney disease is the attention that it's getting now. The, the doctors that I personally work with who kind of had that passion for the patient who is trying to implement the care back in the healthcare, uh, the innovation, you know, companies ask me, well, what'll make you stop working with us? And I tell them the minute they stop working, uh, the minute they stand still, the minute that they uh, are complacent with their, with what they have is when I will leave because as a patient, I can't be complacent. You'll never buy the same model car every year. You'll never buy a 207 every year in this 2025. You're going to want that 2025. You're going to want an option to have a newer car, newer model. So let's treat us the same way. We can't stay with the same thing 
the whole time that we're in this process. We want options. We want to be able to move forward as well. So innovation, the competition is, is key. Competition drives innovation. So I love seeing all these new machines and new ways of dialysis. Yeah, I love it because for me, it's like, man, this is going to push the company out where harder to be better, you know, and, and, and it gives hope to the future, hopefully in real talk. And I tell this to everybody, I would love to be able to bankrupt all dialysis companies and, and, and stop dialysis. Oh, I want them to go broke. But right now, that's that, it's keeping us alive. So I'm with it and I want it to continue to grow and do better for the future. As far as parting thoughts, man. I just want everybody just to, to just to live their life, man. Happiness is key. Smile every day. Love yourself first because you can't love others if you don't love you. Look in the mirror. See who you are. Love it. Continue to win every day. When you wake up, open your eyes. You've won. When you took a step, you've won. You have food in your plate. You've won. You, you win more times before you have a cup of coffee. Just keep that mentality. People say, oh, that's so extreme. If you live like that, I, I guarantee you, your life, will, you'll feel so much more fulfilled with every every step you take. It's like, man, I've won 59 times. I ain't even get to the bathroom yet. You know what I mean? It's just like you got to live like that. And that's the way I live. And I push that on everybody. And I, you know, I just push that energy out there. It's not just for me. It's for everyone. So I just want our, my CKD warriors to continue to live through this. Fight it just hard. Educate yourself. Be proactive. Get in there. Ask questions. Don't there's no stupid questions. And, you know, and, and when you get the knowledge, pass the knowledge on to others so they can live better as well. And, uh, you know, I just pray for everybody just to be great, just to be happy, man, honestly. No stupid questions. Uh, it's no about your questions. life. Uh, so you have to you have to figure it out. Um, and wins David only, Rush. of course. Wins exactly. only, baby. Wins Always. only. David Rush, everybody. Thank you very much, David. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh,